Today we're talking about how to create a successful newsletter as a startup founder. We've got our expert with us today, Michael Hauck, who went from leading a Series A startup to going full-time on his newsletter and personal brand, where he's built massive audiences, both not just his newsletter, but also on Twitter and LinkedIn too. And what's incredible is how quickly he's been able to do this, and very intentionally too, he's treated it just like a business, which is something that many people listening could learn from. So, Michael, great to have you on. I've been following you for some time. You've gone this interesting journey of being a startup founder and raising capital to now being a creator. And it's not a journey that you see very often. But I know many founders who want to do what you've done. Why did you start your personal brand in the first place? Yeah, I mean, you know, so just for some context, started creating content on social media a few years back while I was at my last startup have grown on Twitter to, I think, 50K uh, now, LinkedIn 40K and the newsletters at 90. The reason for that is, you know, you want to be able to generate attention for what you're building, right? And I think a lot of people underestimate the impact of that, even though it's talked about online and, and things like that. You know, being active on Twitter or X, I guess now, um, and social media in general, let me you know, get connected to some of the best investors in the world for my last startup. Let me um, hire people from, you know, amazing places like Stanford Graduate School of Business and top startups like Uber and, and Google and, and you know, other places. We even hired a Y Combinator founder uh, at our last startup. So all of that attention brings a lot of gravity to what you're doing and brings interesting people around you and gets them involved. And that can accelerate things way faster than you'd otherwise be able to. Now, Obviously, it takes a lot of time to create that content and to do it well. And so I do think that as a founder, skills like copywriting, skills like growth and growth marketing are more important now than they've ever been. Um, you know, in a world where there's all these AI tools that make creating software easier than ever, no code tools that kind of you know transition to AI assisted tools, right? In that world, the product itself is less of a differentiator. And I think that that vector will continue to like increasingly be true product driven moats will be less valuable. And the two moats that become valuable are, you know, one is data, obviously, for these like large language models, but that's another point. In this case, the second moat is distribution, right? If you can drive attention to what you're doing, that's a more valuable asset relative to other assets today than it was, you know, five years ago even. So that's what drove my interest in it originally. Also, you're able to drive a lot of customers and, and users and, and things like that too. But um, it was more so getting the right people involved in what we were doing. And so, yeah, that's kind of how it started. I, it was able to, you know, helped us generate a lot of attention, a lot of hype for our last startup. We were featured in, you know, uh, all over the place, great publications um, and uh, and got a lot of interesting people involved. And you, you mentioned there about copywriting being a skill that founders and shoulders should do. And often like so I've done in the past, go to asking for different founders and that kind of thing. So do you think that people can like realistically replace themselves by hiring that out? What do you think is a skill they should, they should really have themselves? Yeah. I mean, look, as a, as a founder, your time is your most valuable asset, right? Your startup should not exist. It's going to be really hard for it to continue to exist, right? You have to grind and, you know, put in the, the 80 plus hour weeks, um, week after week after week. And so anytime you spend on something other than directly on the growth or on the product, talking to customers uh, can be seen as like tough to justify, in my opinion, building a personal brand around yourself actually accomplishes those goals, though, because, again, it attracts the right people, right? So maybe it leads to a step change in the amount of capital you have at your disposal. Maybe it leads to the right you know, designer or engineer joining your team. And maybe it leads to becomes a growth channel for you, especially in the early days, right, where you don't have a lot of money to spend on paid acquisition. You don't have any big partnerships. You don't have the leverage to get them, Right. Organic content marketing is a way to do that. So in my mind, building up that copywriting skill, studying what's worked for, you know, the great content creators out there is worthwhile. And, you know, it'll, you'll be bad at it at first, right? I was too. It took me a while before my first thread went viral or anything like that. But yeah, it's worth it's worth devoting the time to because it it's a it's a very cost effective way to reach some of your early goals. And obviously, so at one point you were doing it for your startup and then it became your main area that you're focused on, right? And how did your 
content change in that time? Because were you creating content very intentionally in terms of driving customers and driving attention to the startup? And then once it was your business to be a creator or content creation, did you feel more free or did you keep it along the same lines anyway? I think that for some people, they probably would because, you know, I, I was working with a founder recently, a founder I advise who, um, you know, his startup is in a specific niche and he's like, oh, I have to create content for this niche now. And it's like his existing audience is not in that niche, right? So there's like an adjustment period. And then later, if the startup fails, he'll have to, <laughs> have to do it again. I sort of am, am lucky here that, you know, my startup was servicing founders and now my current company, my creator business um, is also focused on servicing founders, right? The, the newsletter is, a, is an advice column for startup founders uh, and the community is for startup founders and the tools that we build help them grow their startups faster. So yeah, I would say I'm kind of a special case there, but in general, it's definitely a challenge. Um, I think navigating that is, you know, you just kind of got to grit your teeth and and, and do it. Um, in some cases, that's going to result in audience churn or low engagement. If you see that for a little bit of time, then it might be better to just start a new account from scratch and focus on your niche, whether that account is you know anonymous or uh, branded around you. Either one can work. What I would say is don't brand it around the company because people are you know a lot less a lot less excited about uh you know caring about brands than they are about caring about individuals or anonymous figures it's even something i do myself so with the different brands it's and if i post it from my personal account it will tend to do better and i can frame it of like tagging the company account but when it's a company account thing it always just feels a bit more like an ad i think a lot of the time right and it's we we i think we're so used enough to phasing out ads we don't really want to see ads so especially I think in a social media feed. I think it's different when it's from a trusted source, but when you see some of the stuff come up in feed, like, okay, they're trying to sell to me something, right? Yeah, it's like, why does why does the social media account from the brand even exist, right? It's not for customer support most of the time. Most of the time it's for brand awareness marketing and like shaping their brand image, or it's literally to get you to click on the page and convert and sell you something, right? Um, when I see some of these brands, like... <laughs> I see some of these brands like try really hard to be part of like the culture and what's going on and be meme accounts and things like that. It's so cringe because you know that it's inauthentic. You know that they're just doing it so that they can associate with what's going on right now. The authenticity you get from an individual account, a face-to-face um, voice really is, uh, is I think what drives people to actually care about, uh, about products and also about the people behind them. Yeah. I- what made you decide once you once your startup like wasn't working out, you thought I'm going to go all in on the content creation side, or was it even a conscious decision, or did it just happen that way? It was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like you know, I left my startup in December of last year, so almost a year now, right? And um, I had started the newsletter in September of that year as just like a little side project. Again, want a personal brand so that I can drive attention to the startup. That was the goal. Right. But when I left the startup, I still had this newsletter and, you know, I was like, all right, well, what do I do? Um, I thought about founding another company right away. I thought about diving into AI because, you know, a year ago, ChatGPT had just been released and it was like, whoa, like everything's going to change. Right. Um, And everything has changed. But yeah, already. Wow. Yeah, I know. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, this surprises me too. Uh, But, um, yeah, so I, I thought about that. You know, I was a data scientist at um, at Airbnb when I first joined before I became a product manager, and I built you know a product analytics team at Uber. So like, data stuff is in my in my brain in my DNA, right? So um, I thought about that, but I already had this sort of like asset of the newsletter, and I was like, well, let me just spend a little bit of time this year seeing kind of what happens with that, right? And seeing if I can turn it into a business. So my goal was, you know after I had been studying people like Sahil Bloom and Lenny Richitsky, like, you know, friends of mine, we, we talked about it. They, um, they said, yes, this can be a viable business, good cash flowing asset. And I was like, all right, let me give it a shot. So my goal for the year was 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year. We ended up hitting that by July. Right. And so I was like, at that point I was like, okay, well maybe there's something here. Maybe I should build this into a bigger thing and actually keep spending attention on it rather than jump right back into another venture play where it's kind of all or nothing. Um, so I still might do that in the future, but my thought process was basically like, let me just see where this asset 
can go and see what I can do with it uh, because I already I already have it and it's uh, and there's a playbook that I can run with it. What do you think enabled you to grow so quickly? Like beat your target so much higher than you thought you would? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we talked a little bit about this, but my I think coming to a creator business from a venture backed startup as a founder in particular was a huge advantage, right? Because as a founder, you, know, you need to obsess over every little detail um, and over optimize things to some degree, just to make sure that you understand every step of your funnel, every way that you're acquiring customers, what your customers actually care about versus what you think they care about. Right. And so I think that the number one thing was that I've engaged my readers and my audience very, very deeply as many ways as I possibly can. Right. Like every week I talk to folks in our community in one-on-ones so that I can understand what's, what's the biggest problem they're having right now. What are they going to the newsletter or the community for? What are they, what do they think is lacking from it? Right. Like I want that feedback. And so I think that doing that from the very early days let me move really quickly and iterate on different ways to grow and kind of find the find the right ways. For us, that was, you know, lead magnets early on on social media that we drove a lot of attention to and then they blew up and got a lot of subscribers. I think we drove like 15,000 subscribers over six weeks with that in the spring. And then after that, you know, we were able to start selling some ads and get some revenue in. And I basically operated with this mindset where like, I want a 0% margin on my business for as long as I can like personally afford to have it. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I see a lot of creators talk about like, Oh, I want I have my 95% margin business, you know, X, Y, Z. Like, that's great. I think that's a great business. It's good for them. But my mindset is how much can I invest without like putting myself in a financially bad situation in order to grow faster. Um, and so that's what I've been doing throughout the most part of this year. The revenue that I get, I'm just reinvesting it in, in paid acquisition channels. Um, and so that flywheel has allowed us to grow to the point that we are now, uh, I think faster than I expected for sure. And also faster than a lot of the people who I spoke to uh, in the early days when I told them that I was doing a newsletter and they're like, Oh, you're crazy. Why don't you just do another startup? Uh, so it's uh, it's been a fun year for sure. I'm right saying you use Beehive as well, right? I use Beehive. Uh, been a customer of Beehive since day one. I'm also an investor in Beehive, so a big fan of what they're doing. They're shipping so fast. Now, I think I looked at other options at the time when I started, and a lot of them did different things. Some of them were like you know more for selling products. Others were more for reading, and they optimized for the reader experience. But what Beehive did really well, and I think why they've been able to be so successful this year is because they hyper optimized on the newsletter writer experience and specifically like newsletters right it is a t- beehive is a tool for newsletters uh, it's it doesn't you know pretend to be more than that so i think that's worked out really well for them cuz what i was going to mention there is like i know we we used beehive as well we've had Tyler Denk on the podcast before too and how you can tell the different acquisition channels and how well they're doing and why you should ask you that is because you've used quite a lot of paid acquisition have you found those people to be as loyal to the newsletter compared to organic s- subscribers or what's been your experience of that? Yeah. I mean, you're never going to get folks who are quite as uh, engaged on, in aggregate, right? From a paid source as you are from an organic source, like the open rates and the click rates that we see from uh, people who find me through Twitter or through LinkedIn or even through you know SEO, those are higher than what we see through all of our paid acquisition channels, right? Whether it's uh, meta ads on Facebook and Instagram, whether it's Twitter ads, whether it's like a, a, a network like Sparkloop, right? Anything we see through that channel, it's not going to be quite on the same level, but the drop-off is, I think, less than people think it is, right? We see decent open rates from all of our paid acquisition channels. Um, and um, that's why we've continued to double down on them. You know, our, our open rate for the newsletter as a whole is in like the 50 to 55% range every single week. And so you know, we wouldn't be in that range if we were, <laughs> if we were putting money into, into channels that, uh, that didn't yield good results. And obviously as part of this now, so you've grown, it was like nine, over 90,000 people that subscribe it, right? And you've now, you've also, one of the interesting things you've done is that the niche of what you've gone into is a very high value audience. So it's similar to what we have is like, is people are into entrepreneurship. And I think, to us, I think your target are even people are maybe slightly above where we are. So we might have more people who are aspiring to think about it someday. Let's say more of your audience will be a bit further ahead and they think about different problems. And also that's a highly valuable audience, right? So you've, I know you do sponsorship for the newsletter and that's one way you monetize. 
but you've also got your own product, so you know will benefit your customers too, your subscribers too. And can you walk us through? I think it's Megaphone is one that I know I've seen in your myself. That is really interesting that I know really aligns with the audience. Yeah, I mean, um, so our our subscriber base is over 50%, um, pretty, pretty substantially over 50%, like active current people who are starting startups, right? Whether they're solo businesses, whether they're venture-backed startups, a good portion of them are actually venture-backed. But as far as like business owners, it's it's way over 50%. And then the remaining is split between people who've previously founded a business and people who tell us that they like actively want to start one in the future. There's like a very small percent of people who are like just interested in startups, but that's a that's a very small part of our subscriber base. Um, so yes, definitely a high value niche. Uh, we've been able to work with some great partners across you know tools for startups, uh, services for startups, and uh, and also services to help founders manage the things outside of work, right? Because <laughs> you don't have a lot of time to do that as a founder. So uh, lots of different types of partners. Uh, I've had a lot of success with them. The majority of our sponsors at this point are repeat sponsors. So we need to do less time on outbound sales, which has been has been nice. But yeah, as far as like understanding our audience, you know, everyone who subscribes fills out a survey and they give us some information about about how they you know, identify as a founder or where their company's at and then what stage and things like that. So um, yeah, I feel like we have a good handle on it. And that lets us kind of drill down deeper into like, are we serving the needs of the different cohorts of our audience, different segments of our audience? So yeah, so Megaphone is something that we spun up uh, at this point a couple months ago, uh, near the end of the summer. Um, there was no code for a while, but we, we just launched an actual platform for an actual software platform. Uh, basically, it's a it's a engagement network for social media. So if folks are looking to grow their personal brand as founders or grow their company account, um, either one, uh, they can sign up and they you know pay a monthly subscription and then they get access to the network. Once they're in the network, they you know, can deposit money into their wallet and they share a post with us. They tell us what like niche they're in and how much budget they want to put behind the post, and then our algorithm will match them with like the best creators in that niche who are currently online and available to engage with their post. So, you know, I've pulled my personal network uh, to bring in a bunch of creators to be part of this and the creators refer each other. So the network is just growing and growing and growing. We have over a hundred creators on the platform now in various niches. I think, you know, business related niches are, are probably the, the ones where we have the most density, but expands to everything from sports to arts to finance and a whole bunch of different things. So, so yeah, so you share a post with us and it goes out to the network. Creators engage with it right away. They only get paid if they engage within the first hour. So it's actually like meaningful engagement. And then you can see the performance of the post on our dashboard and, and things like that. And you know, it's great for driving leads. It's great for building your following on social media. It's great for brand awareness marketing too. Kind of all three of those use cases work pretty well for it. Kind of the, the dirty secret of social media is that accounts tend to get big because they have relationships with existing big accounts. And so those big accounts comment on, you know, your posts and you get that social proof associated with, with your content and their audience gets exposed to your content. And if you're in the same niche, a lot of those people will follow you too. So uh, it's a long way of saying that we've sort of democratized that. And now anyone can kind of have access to, you know, engage with these creators. Um, and so we launched that a couple months ago. It's been growing pretty fast um, and we've been scrambling to build as much software as we can. So uh, big plans for it. Uh, no plans to raise money as of right now, but it's been an, it's been a fast growing thing so far. In the past, you raised capital before, right? Yep. So yep. for a lot of people that may be first time founders, there's a lot of focus on raising capital and mm. how it's almost seen like the achievement itself rather than the means to an end. <laughs> and obviously, because you've had that experience in the past, you can think about it in a different way to other people might do, right? Yeah. And I guess you must know if you can make it profitable without taking venture capital, why give away equity? So what's behind, what would trigger you to think, okay, maybe I should take money on at this stage? Yeah. I mean, so I've seen it from both sides, right? So I've, we raised two rounds of capital for my last startup. We raised our series A from Andreessen Horowitz, you know, one of the best venture firms in the, in the world. Um, and I've also been a VC, right? So we raised a venture fund, made over 50 investments in early stage startups. Some of those have gone on to exit or, you know, have been marked up significantly. Um, and you have your wins and your losses in there, but I've seen it from both sides. So I think the way I think about it now is, you know, the capital environment now is very different than it was a couple of years ago, right? You know, higher interest rates cause folks to put their, uh, their assets into like less or their, their money into less risk 
less risky assets than venture. So the amount of money coming into venture, into funds is way, way, way down. And as a result, you know, the people who are running these funds uh, need to allocate their capital much more carefully, both to doubling down on their existing portfolio companies and also maybe making fewer bets on newer companies that are trying to raise money, right? I think that'll continue throughout 2024. And so, you know, obviously having raised capital before, having built a startup before, it's easier to go out and raise capital again than it would be for a first time founder. But even so, you know, I think that if you can create the business to be a cash flowing business and have it grow fast enough where you're able to capture the market, um, that's that's a really appealing path, right? Because you know, to your point, you, you retain ownership, uh, you retain decision making capabilities. But um, I think the biggest thing is that you know markets will emerge really quickly. And overall, when a market emerges, people jump on it. They realize that it's there. It's not just you. You're not the only person to figure this out, right? And so if you want to capture that market, you have to move quickly. And if you don't move quickly enough, you'll, your startup won't, won't capture it. And so um, what I would say is that like, don't look at raising venture as like, you know, a necessary thing for your startup, but look at it as like an accelerant to help you capture this market. There's a lot of markets that get closed really, really, really quickly and they need venture in order for a company to capture them, right? If that's the case, then 1,000%, go put the money, go, go get the money and, and pour the gasoline on and go as fast as you can. But I don't think that's true for every market. And so uh, we're going to have to close off pretty soon, but what's some of the most exciting things that you've got going on in the future? Like, what should people listening now be paying attention to? Like, where's your energy going? Yeah, I mean, you know, Megaphone is, is something we're really excited about. Um, I think that can be a pretty big business. Um, so we're just focused on building the network, both on the user side and on the creator side. Also, you know, we have our founder community tied to the newsletter. Um, I've been spending a lot of time on like an educational arm of that. So building out, uh, you know, building out courses, building out playbooks, getting templates of like, you know, the legal docs that you need to start up or, you know, whatever it may be. And also looping in a lot of experts from my network to help create those. So that's something we're going to be rolling out um, sometime over the next month or two. Uh, we're building up kind of a, a big initial batch to kind of launch with. Um, but yeah, excited about both of those things right now. And obviously continuing to, uh, to work on the newsletter and to, to write that every week. So one of the things I think sometimes happens to other people is that creative burnout side of things, right? Where you're writing high quality newsletter every week. How do you maintain that cadence to keep putting out value? Yeah. I mean, I do my best to like try to batch things in advance, right? Whether it's my content on social media, although I haven't been good about that recently, um, or the newsletter itself. I try to batch it a couple weeks in advance. So I'm not always on that treadmill, but you can't always do that. You know, sometimes you've got other things that come up. So I totally, I totally get it. And oftentimes it'll be, you know, the day before and I'll be, I'll be spending the whole day writing, writing the newsletter. Right. So I think the way to avoid burnout is to try to batch it. And if you can't to just sort of understand what you signed up for, like I, I, a lot of people ask me for like, what's the work-life balance advice as a startup founder or, or as a creator now, right? Honestly, building a business is really hard. And getting it to be successful and grow and sustain that success is incredibly hard. Not a lot of people are cut out for it. Um, and so I think if you're serious about it and serious about making it your you know, personal income stream, you know, personal business, whatever it might be, you've just got to be ready to, to sort of grind. And that's not popular advice, right? Everyone wants the hack to, to make things easier or to, um, to cut corners or whatever it might be. But business is a grind. You're, you're always fighting to to find the the next advantage. The market's always changing. Customer expectations are always changing. You have to be adaptable. And in order to be that adaptable that quickly, you have to be in the weeds. Um, so my advice is to just like realize what you signed up for. <laughs> I completely agree with that. There's so many people who I guess they put in a message that doing what you're doing or doing what founders are doing, whatever it is, and making it easy. And they're trying to show, oh, here's how you use these templates. And you can, but after a while, like whatever templates you're using, most people can't keep it up. And that's the, it's often is people are outlasted, right? Is that who can keep doing it even when it's no longer fun anymore? It's no longer, well, I, at the beginning, it's exciting. There's a honeymoon phase, right? Like, oh, I get to write this and now people are reading it. But then there's a, especially at kind of your stage as well, where when you've got 90,000 people like getting their email every week, there's a pressure that comes with that too, right? <laughs> oh, I've got to do something good here because people it's going to pay attention. When at the beginning, nobody's reading it. It doesn't really matter if it's like if it's not very good. Whereas now, people might be like, "Oh, I signed up to this guy, but oh, this he's not he's going down." Or there's 
these different pressures that come into play. And I think sometimes people have this idea that it gets easier later on. Whereas I think I found the opposite with the writing of Medium, where I grew like fairly, so it was like, it was six, 7,000, I think, when I stopped being active on it. And every time I published it, I had so much extra pressure because I'm like, well, people are actually going to read this now. <laughs> I, I don't know how you found that. Have you found that kind of seep into your brain a bit now? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, I think if you go into build a business because you think it's going to be fun, you're in for a bad time. But if you forget how rewarding it is versus the alternative of just punching the clock, right? Um, and building that ownership and the, and the value and the the pride that comes along with that, I think it becomes really, really easy. And it kind of brings back some of that fun feeling, right? So for me, I have a good time with my business. Uh, it's obviously very hard to build, but I don't get caught up in in the pressure side and the stress side. You know, um, I've been in some very, very high pressure situations in my career, uh, both with my own companies and also working at Uber and Airbnb. So um, that type of stuff doesn't really phase me. I think as, a, as an entrepreneur, you can't, you just can't think about it, right? It's it's not your mandate. Your mandate is to seek out the highest, like the, the highest problem, the biggest problem that you have and the highest leverage opportunity that you have. Those are the kind of the two things that I, I recommend founders to focus on at, at a time, nothing more than that. And so, you know, with that kind of mindset, you're, you're diving into the belly of the beast. You're, you're attacking it head on. And so the, the outside pressures and things like that don't, don't factor into it. Keeping up a schedule of an email twice a week, Tuesdays and Saturdays is no big deal compared to, <laughs> compared to some of the other things. So um, yeah, not a factor in my mind. So thanks so much for coming on today. If people want to find out more about you, follow the newsletter, where should they go to? Yeah, to follow the newsletter, go to join.hauk.news. Um, you can sign up there. Um, and then uh, Megaphone is megaphone.network. Uh, that's uh, that's a, the product we're growing right now. So those are the two places I would say. I'm also on Twitter uh, at CallMeHauk. Hauk.